6.7 relative rates of growth. So many times throughout Calculus 1, for example, we've talked about functions having different rates of growth, and we've clearly been able to see the rates of growth of two functions compared to each other. So for example, with two simple functions like y equals x squared and y equals x cubed, we know that the derivatives of those functions, which in this case would be 2x and 3x squared, measure the rates of change of those functions. And obviously as x increases, 3x squared is going to get, well, it's going to be bigger than 2x and it only gets bigger than 2x. That is, the gap between these two rates of growth gets larger as x increases. And so from that point of view, it was pretty easy for us to believe that x cubed was what we would call a faster growing function than x squared. That is, the instantaneous rate of change of x cubed is always larger than the instantaneous rate of change of x squared, and the difference between those rates of change increases as x increases. So this is a faster growing function, and it gets faster growing all the time compared to the rate of growth of x squared. Okay, so for simple functions for which we're able to compute relatively simple derivatives, it's been pretty easy for us to look at those two simple derivatives and get a sense of which function was growing faster than the other in that sense. Of course, the problem is, what if it's hard to look at those two derivatives? What if they're more complicated? It might be hard to compare the rates of growth of the two functions in this way. So now in this section, we have a much simpler way to compare the rates of growth of two functions. So let's suppose that f of x and g of x are both positive for, let's say, sufficiently large x. So what we're going to try and do is compare the rates of growth of these two functions. Let's say they both are growing functions, and eventually they're both positive if we just make x big enough. So what we're going to do is look at the ratio of f to g, and we're going to ask what happens when we take the limit as x approaches positive infinity of that ratio. Okay, so let's consider a few cases for what could happen when we take that limit. That limit could be infinity. That limit could be zero. Or that limit, if it does exist, could equal some finite L where L is positive not infinite, so a, let's say, finite positive limit. And those are the three cases we want to think about. So let's think about case one for a moment. So let's suppose the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x over g of x is positive infinity. So let's think about what that means, it means that if I'm given m greater than 0, and let's just say this m greater than 0 is some, let's say, very large y value, then if the limit of this ratio is infinity, it means that when I pick that arbitrarily large y value, there is some n value positive such that if we choose x values that are at least as big as n, in other words, sufficiently large, then we know f of x over g of x 
will be greater than m. And that comes straight from the definition of what it means to say the limit as x approaches infinity of a function is infinity. It means that if we choose a large enough or any large y value, then I should be able to choose sufficiently large x values so that the function evaluated at those x values will be larger than that arbitrary y value that I've chosen. What happens if I make this m value bigger? Well, then I'll probably need to choose bigger x values to make sure that my function exceeds that larger y value. Now, of course, the other way I can say that is f of x is now greater than m times g of x. Okay, now the key here is we chose this m arbitrarily. We said choose any large m value that you want. And if the limit of this ratio is infinity, it means when x is big enough, I can make f of x greater than an arbitrarily large constant times my function. Okay, what that means is what? When x is big enough, I'm guaranteed that f of x is always bigger than this constant m times my function g. And I can do that for any arbitrarily large constant. Okay, what that means is, if I were to look at the graph of f of x and to look at the graph of m times g of x, well, there's some n where when I get to that n, if I look at the graph of m times g of x, and I look at the graph of f of x, we're saying the graph of f of x should be above the graph of m times g of x. Then we're saying that if you make that m bigger, then there should be some larger n, or if I go to that larger n, the graph of f is still above the graph of m times g of x. In other words, m times g of x will never catch up with f of x. In fact, what I'm doing in this series of graphs where I'm talking about increasing that m value, I'm making that m bigger. And even though I'm making it bigger, the f of x always manages to stay ahead of m times g x. That means f must be growing faster than g is. It has to because I'm making this function bigger by putting a bigger and bigger m in front of it. And no matter how big I make that m, the graph of f is still bigger. All right, in that sense, we're going to say that the conclusion then is that f of x grows, we'll say, faster than g of x. So let me write that on the next page. So if f and g are positive for sufficiently large x, and the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x over g of x is infinite, then my conclusion is f of x is a faster growing function than g of x. With a similar argument, we could conclude that if the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x over g of x is 0, then g of x grows faster than f of x. Or to say that in another way, f of x grows slower than g of x. Okay, now we did list a third case. So I'm listing these formally as rules for what it means when the limit of the ratio is infinity or the limit of the ratio is zero. The third case was what does it mean when the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x over g of x equals a finite limit, finite positive limit. 
And this one's the interesting one. So let's think about what it means to say that limit is L. It means that if I'm given some epsilon greater than zero, we want to normally think of that epsilon as being a very small number. Um, again, there is some x value, let's say n greater than zero, such that if x is larger than that n, then we know our function f of x over g of x is going to stay close to that limit, as close as I want it to be. And in this case, the tolerance I'm insisting on is epsilon. Okay, so that's just our formal definition of the limit, of what it means to say the limit as x approaches infinity of that function equals L. So let's suppose in our problem, let's suppose we have two functions. Let's suppose the limit of the ratio of those two functions is L. And let's choose a particular epsilon, because I can pick any epsilon I want. Let's pick epsilon to equal L over 2. So whatever this limit is, let's pick epsilon to be half of it. And after you see what I'm going to do here, you'll realize that choice of L over 2 is just a preference choice. I could complete this proof with many different choices on that epsilon. But of course, what this means is there is some n greater than 0 such that if x is larger than that n, then f of x over g of x minus my limit is less than epsilon, and I've chosen that epsilon to be L over 2. Okay, what does that say? Well, if I translate that into a pair of inequalities without absolute value, it would say negative L over 2 is less than f of x over g of x minus L is less than L over 2. If I added L to all three parts, I would get L over 2 is less than F over G is less than 3L over 2. For sufficiently large X, we know that F and G are both positive. So let's assume that we are sufficiently large for that. If this N is not sufficiently large enough for f and g to both be positive, we'll just keep going even further until we finally hit a point where f and g are both positive for all values after that. So let's assume we've found an n that does both of those things. If g is positive, I should be able to multiply all parts by g. And of course, that's just going to give me an f of x in the middle. On the outsides, it's going to give me constant multiples of g. L over 2 times g on the left, 3L over 2 times g on the right. So let's think about what this says, because of course it says two things. It says that L over 2 times g is less than f of x, and it says f of x is less than 3 all over 2 times g. And of course this second one I could also write as g of x is greater than 2 over 3l times f of x. Okay now you should see that this inequality tells me that f grows faster than g. That is, if I looked at it in the way that we looked at this a few moments ago with number 1 and number 2 here above. And if I were only looking at this inequality, that would be my conclusion. Okay, what would my conclusion be if I looked at only this inequality? Well, again, since g is larger than a constant times f, my conclusion there would be that g 
grows faster than f. And of course, I know that both of these things can't be true. I can't have f growing faster than g and g growing faster than f. So of course, there seems to be a contradiction there, but there really isn't. If you think uh, more graphically about it, what you're saying is once we get to that n, we're really talking about three graphs. We're saying that the smallest of those three graphs is L over 2 times G. The largest is 3L over 2G. And we're saying F of X is trapped between the two of them. So let's put it this way. We, we know from looking at these two that F can't be growing faster than G. We know from looking at these two that G can't be growing faster than F. Okay, if that's the case, what we're going to say is that F and G grow at the same rate. That is, F is never going to exceed a constant multiple of G, and G is never going to exceed a constant multiple of F. If that's the case, F is not really trying to race ahead of G, and G is not really trying to race ahead of F. Neither one is growing fast enough to overtake the other one. And in that sense, they are growing at the same speed, or they have the same rate of growth. So case three added to our list is if the limit as x approaches infinity of the ratio of two functions is a finite positive limit, our conclusion is f of x and g of x have the same rate of growth. Okay, so three simple rules, and now you can see where these ideas are coming from. So let's look at a couple of quick examples. Uh, let's look at number six from your text. Um, and in this case, he gives you, in part A, he gives you two functions, log base a of x and ln of x. And he wants you to compare those two functions and see which one's growing faster or are they growing at the same speed. So of course, all I have to do is take the limit as x approaches infinity of the ratio of those two. It doesn't matter what I put where. So I'll just put the log base a of x in the top, and I'll put ln of x in the bottom. Now when I ask what the limit as x approaches infinity of log base a of x over ln of x is, I recognize that the limits of the numerator and denominator are both infinite. So this could be a L'Hopital's rule situation. Um, the other thing, of course, that I can think about is that log base a of x is ln of x over ln of a, which means really we don't need to apply L'Hopital's rule because this is really the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over ln of a. which is simply 1 over ln of a. Okay, and of course for an exponential growth function, ln of a will be positive, so this is a positive finite limit. The conclusion then is that log base a of x and ln of x have the same rate of growth. And that should make sense to you if you think about the fact that log base a of x is just a multiple of ln of x. Log base a of x is precisely ln of x times 1 over ln of a. And we already know the real criterion in deciding whether two functions are growing at the same rate or at different rates 
is in comparing multiples of one function to the other function. In fact, if we think about the graph for a moment, uh, the red graph you see is the graph of L and X. The blue graph you see is log base 2 of X. Now, of course, those bases are pretty close to each other. We know the red one is the natural log, which is base E, which is about 2.7. The blue one is log base 2. And, of course, if I were to follow these graphs out a bit for larger and larger X, in fact, let's take ourselves out to, let's say, around 200. You should notice that the difference between the two graphs doesn't seem like it's changed very much. In fact, the further I go, again, it doesn't look like there's much change when I compare the two graphs. Okay, and the graph is really showing us what this limit is telling us, that neither one of those graphs is going to overtake the other one. There may be some minor fluctuations along the way, but they're going to stay more or less at the same relative position to one another that they were earlier on, even when X gets arbitrarily large. Uh, let's think about number 6, part C. Here they're asking us to compare ln of x and 1 over the square root of x. Okay, so again, I'll take the limit as x goes to infinity of ln x over 1 over square root of x, which of course is just limit as x approaches infinity of square root of x times ln of x. And we know both of these functions go to infinity. So the product goes to infinity. And our conclusion, if the limit of the ratio goes to infinity, is that the top function, that is the numerator, must be growing faster than the denominator. So in this case, my conclusion would be ln of x grows faster than 1 over the square root of x. Let's look at one more from that problem. So again, number 6, and now I'm looking at part g. Uh, this time the functions are ln of x and the ln of the ln of x. And so again, I'll take the limit as x approaches infinity of the ratio. Okay, of course, I realize both of those functions are tending to infinity as x approaches infinity. Uh, this might be a good time to apply L'Hopital's rule. Uh, there's no simplification that gives me an easy to recognize form here. So in that case, since I realize both of these are infinity and that this is an indeterminate infinity over infinity form, I'll go ahead and apply L'Hopital's rule, which means I'll look at the limit as x approaches infinity of the derivative of the numerator over the derivative of the denominator. The derivative of that numerator would be 1 over ln of x times the derivative of ln x, which would be 1 over x, over the derivative of ln x which would just be 1 over x. And of course, in the limit, this will reduce to limit x approaches infinity of 1 over ln x. And of course, that limit is 0. Okay, what does it mean when I get a limit of 0? It means that the bottom function, the denominator, is the faster growing function. Again, think about what happens in a fraction. The only way that fraction is going to approach zero is that the denominator is growing faster than the numerator so that it outpaces the growth of that numerator. So in this case, I'll say ln of x grows faster than the ln of the ln of x. 
So as you think about these examples, one of the things that may need to occur to you is that all of the functions we've talked about that are growth functions, so polynomial growth functions, radical growth functions, logarithmic and exponential growth functions, it seems like we're in a position now to come up with some sort of hierarchy that describes the relative rates of growth of these different functions. That is, which ones are the fastest growing functions, which are the slowest, and comparatively, is there a hierarchy that tells me how they rank against each other? So I'll just state here as a point of reference that the exponential function, if we're just thinking about the basic functions we've talked about so far, the natural exponential function is going to be growing faster than any power function. So this would be where, when I say power function, I mean n is greater than or equal to 1. And of course, power functions like that are faster growing than functions like 1 over n, where n is, let's say, greater than 1. So I'm talking about radical functions, x to the one-half, x to the one-third, and so on. And it does turn out that all three of those are actually faster growing than the natural log function. So if we were ranking these four basic functions, we're saying this one grows faster than this one, which grows faster than this one, which grows faster than this one. And you should certainly be able to verify any of those by doing the comparison that we've described with this rule by looking at the limit of the ratio. I'll do one more for you uh, that is sort of in this vein. So let's look at number 22 uh, where he gives you these two functions. He says let's compare ln of x and any polynomial. And the question is, which one is faster growing, which one is slower growing? And of course, based on what I'm telling you up here, um, there's a monomial, so that's the building block of a polynomial, and there's ln of x. And my hierarchy suggests that the polynomial should be the faster growing one. All right, so what do I need to write down here to compare these two? Well, what do I mean when I say any polynomial? I mean an arbitrary polynomial of arbitrary degree. So let's say a sub n x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 down to some x squared term, some x term, let's say a sub 1 x, and then some constant term a sub 0. And so what I want to do is take the limit of the ratio of ln of x to this general polynomial and of course both are growing without bounds so I can apply L'Hopital's rule. Okay if I apply L'Hopital's rule uh, what happens? Well of course the top becomes 1 over x when I take the derivative the bottom becomes, well, I'm just going to use the power rule on each term. So it would be n times a sub n x to the n minus 1 plus n minus 1 a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 2 down 2. Okay, just to write it down, what's going to happen with those terms at the end? That second degree term is going to become 2 a sub 2 x and then that first degree term becomes a sub 1 and the constant term disappears when I take the derivative. Of course what's going to happen with that 1 over x that's really dividing by x which means if I rewrite this what I really have is 1 over the denominator that you see multiplied by x which means we're back to n a sub n x to the n plus n minus 1 a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 
This term, of course, will become 2a sub 2x squared, and this term will become a sub 1x. Okay, if we assume that this was a polynomial of degree at least 1, then of course what we're looking at here in this denominator is a polynomial of degree 1, at least degree 1. And if it's at least degree 1 and it's a growing function, then we know the growth is controlled by this leading term. And so if I ask what's the limit of 1 over a polynomial and that polynomial's growth is really determined by that leading term, and I know that's a growing function, then I know this limit is 0. And what that tells me when I look at the original limit I was taking of that log function over that general polynomial, the conclusion, of course, is that the general polynomial grows faster than the ln of x. And I think that's a good place to stop with that example. Let me know if you have any questions.